Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Communication, the Key to Helping Families and Patients. My name is Karen Koch, and I'm the Director of Mental Health Education at Eastern AHEC. This webinar series is part of our Child Mental Health and Primary Care Statewide Project funded through NCAHEC. This funding allows this series to be offered free to participants from across the state. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Hodgson. She's a professor and director of the Medical Family Therapy Doctoral Program at East Carolina University. She received her master's in science degree in applied family and child studies from Northern Illinois University and her PhD in human development and family studies with a specialization in marriage and family therapy from Iowa State University. She has received multiple awards for her work, including the Nancy Darden Distinguished Professorship through the College of Health and Human Performance, the College of Health and Human Performance Outstanding Researcher Creative Activity Award, University Scholars Award, and the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association Wingspan Honoree. She's published extensively and presented both statewide and nationally. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a level two EMDR trained therapist, and an approved supervisor through the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. So please welcome Dr. Hodgson. Thank you very much. And I am so glad to be here with all of you so the objectives of the talk are to talk about functional and dysfunctional patterns of communication. Now, we don't have any examples of that going on in the world, I'm sure, but we're going to focus on that specific to working with diverse family systems, because not only is communication challenging, but it's even more challenging when we come from different experiences, different cultural identities, um, different religions, different ethnicities. So we really want to be able to focus on some of the unique differences that might happen. And then what are some streamlined ways that we can communicate to maximize our ability to get the information we need and provide good care. We'll talk a little bit about some strategies to improve family communication and engaging families in treatment through that. And then I'm going to ask us to just reflect a little bit on personal biases and beliefs that we might have about communication. And we're actually going to start off the presentation with a little thinking exercise. So because we're not going to be having an interactive presentation, which are really my favorites, but I'm going to ask you to interact a little bit just with your thoughts. And if you have the ability to write them down, that's great. If you're driving or you're doing something else, just take a moment and think about what do you consider functional communication to look like? What is healthy functional communication look like when it's happening? If we were to take a video of a really good effective conversation happening, what would be happening? And then after that, I want you to do the opposite. When we have individuals who are not having an effective, healthy conversation, what is happening? So I'm just gonna take about a minute and let you think that through. And for those who might be tuning in, I'm just asking you to think about if you were to do a video and document healthy, fun well-functioning communication happening, what would people see in that video? And then if you were to document examples of dysfunctional, unhealthy communication, what would people see in that video? Okay, you probably have a few ideas for each of those. And if your thinking continues on this, that'll be great because you can just apply it as we go. How we communicate and what we consider functional really is influenced by a lot of factors. Um, when we communicate with each other, we take in a lot of the five senses, right? So for example, body language. When we're observing somebody communicate with us, if they're looking off in the distance or looking at their phone, what does that communicate to us? Does it seem like they're disinterested or evasive? Um, if somebody's really close to you and talking to you and it makes you uncomfortable, that can influence your ability to have a really effective conversation or like sometimes happens in my house, people like to have conversations through walls and across 
floors, right? So what did you say? I didn't hear you. So even distance can affect having effective conversations. In some cultures, like particularly with Muslim women, if you ask to shake their hand and you are a member of the opposite sex, that goes against some of their belief systems. So even touching during communication can be something that we really need to be mindful of. Things like hand gestures that we might use like thumbs up in some cultures can be considered extremely disrespectful and rude or the okay sign. So we want to make sure that when we're communicating with diverse groups of people that we're really taking the time to understand and learn their culture and then understand and learn what are some things that we can do that will walk that medium line so that we can have functional and effective communication. We want to make sure that we're addressing people directly. So that's really important in communication that people understand and know who it is that we want to draw into the conversation. Again, we want to be mindful of cultural and language barriers in a lot of the work that we do. And I know we have school nurses and other providers present. We have, I have students who go out and work in community healthcare clinics, and we have patients who speak a large variety of languages. So they have to use a communication tool that allows them to get a live translator to work with patients. So those barriers often historically, when I started doing this work um, here 20 years ago, we didn't have those tools to use. So those people just didn't get served. But now we have resources available to us where we can make bridge those communication gaps and really meet people where they're at so that they can describe what's happening to them in their dominant language. Um, conflict is really interesting between different styles of communication because there's all different ways of showing frustration, right? So we want to make sure when we're engaging in conflict that we're understanding the individuals that we're speaking with and how those individuals best receive feedback or feel free to speak their mind. Um, if there are power imbalances, like a superior um, to somebody who's working under their care may not feel comfortable giving feedback that would potentially result in a conflict or in some cultures like Asian culture, you do not give feedback to your superior, um, especially in front of others for the sake that they would lose face and respect. So there are certain rules around conflict that we really want to make sure we're minding in order to have effective communication. And then the last one is gift giving. Um, and in some cultures and customs, it is norm to give gifts as a sign of appreciation. It's a communication tool that lets people know, I value what you bring. Um, in rural communities, I had one provider that told me he would, he was the only primary care provider in the community and he would go out to his car at the end of the day and it was no telling what vegetables, fruits, live animals would have been in his truck um, at the end of the day, because that's the way the community acknowledged what he provided to them. And so lots of rules around and expectations and ideas around communication, but all of those for certain cultures and groups may be considered functional. There's also rules that kind of happen in families. And if you think about it, and these are just four different types of communication stances, there are many more. Think about your own family and how each person in the family might play a unique role in the way that you balance tension or share information. Um, so there's four different styles that we'll talk about. There's one called the placator, one called the blamer, one super responsible, and one that's called irrelevant. So we'll get to those in a second. So how these styles develop and are used is oftentimes in childhood. Um, when we're growing up in families, we just find that we play a certain role in the way that communication is delivered and shared. And how each person communicates can also really change under stress. So you might be the type of person that when you get stressed, you process a lot and you talk to a lot of people and that's the way you lower your anxiety. 
or other people who get stressed, they might communicate less. I've had people tell me, you'll know I'm stressed when I get quiet. And I'm like, okay, good to know. So whenever I hire new people or I join a team, I like to try to figure out what people look like when they're stressed so that I know how I can most thoughtfully interact with them. Because if I go in and I misread their communication cues, it is going to create unnecessary tension. And then it might cause a conversation that isn't going to result in the best outcome. So we really want to make sure we understand people's communication styles so that they feel safe so that we can have effective conversations. Because if people don't feel safe, they're not going to be true to what their experience is, and you're not going to get that good information you need to provide care. Um, so the placator is one of those roles that I was talking about earlier. Placators in families are often people pleasers. They will do anything to make people happy, even at the sacrifice of their own well-being, unfortunately. And so when we're working with placators, the goal is to get them to focus on themselves versus everybody else. We want them to pay attention to what they're thinking and feeling so that they can best advocate for themselves um, versus always saying and doing things that are good, is going to make everybody else feel better. And then what ends up happening to placaters is they, they sort of, those feelings, those tensions sort of whittle away inside and resentment can build up or it'll come out in other ways. So we want to make sure placators are getting their voice. And if you're the one, you know, in the, the meeting and you notice somebody's falling quiet or they're saying, well, whatever he or she or they want, um, that's the one that we want to sort of work on drawing them out. You want to have them tell their truth and not just give them their opinions. Sometimes placators struggle with words. And so we'll find ourselves giving multiple choice options or do you think or feel this? Um, but creating space so that placators can definitely find their own voice is really what's gonna be extremely helpful in having a good assessment interaction. Um, the thing about placators too is they'll even make up that treatment is helping because they want to keep the peace, right? They don't want you to think you're doing a bad job or you're not being helpful. So you'll say, you know, how did the visit go today? Oh, it was great, you know, and they'll leave and they won't have gotten what they needed from it. When you would have been the type of person that would have totally turned things around and said, all right, that's, we want you to be happy, or I want you to be able to get what you need. Let's try again. What, how can I help you? And a big tip is, you know, not until the placator regularly and openly disagrees with the provider, do you know you have rapport. So if a placator then starts disagreeing and saying, you know, I don't think you quite got that the way I wanted, or I'm, I'm not really happy about this, you haven't joined yet. So watch those placators, make sure they're joining, giving their opinions. Blamers are the other. They're way too focused on their self and the context. Um, so they never accept oftentimes responsibility for themselves. And I wonder if a lot of times blamers when they were young um, were afraid of getting into trouble, right? So they would oftentimes put off these things on somebody else. It's a survival technique and it could be rooted in trauma, but we want to help blamers to increase awareness of other people's thoughts and feelings. And so it's not just about, you know, what's going to ease their anxiety by pushing off tension onto other people, but how might other people be thinking and feeling in this situation? With blamers, and you might have to directly confront them a little bit. So, you know, asking, kind of giving them some feedback on their approach or their behavior or lack of accountability. So this is really important when we're working with patients who might say, well, I didn't eat healthy this week because so-and-so didn't, you know, always wanted to go out to eat, or I didn't cut back on my tobacco use this week because so-and-so was smoking. So we want to really encourage our individuals that we're working with 
to really own their own experiences and to try to move away from blaming onto others. Okay, there's the other type, which is called the super responsible type. And these are people who avoid emotions at all costs. They are very cognitive and they are very, very focused on justifying with context, very about the rules, you know, um, not a lot of flexibility in giving people space and time. They're very, what they call computer-like. So not a lot of emotions, very correct, very proper. And sometimes in human relationships, you have to pay attention to the emotions to be able to connect with the individual. But super responsible people said, you know, would have said, well, yeah, they were crying, but they said they do it, right? So they're going to focus on the thoughts and not read the affect or the feelings and miss that whole part of communication. They may appear very cold and unfeeling while they're really struggling on the inside though. So if you've got somebody who's super responsible, they might be really amped up, but you're not gonna necessarily see that. And what we wanna do is to try to help them focus in on their body, you know, where they're feeling their stress and tension and try to get them to learn how to connect their body to their feelings. And these might be some individuals who come to, to us who have a lot of somatic symptoms because their body is going to speak because they're struggling with connecting to those emotions. So we can really help super responsible communicators um, to tap into where might be they feeling tension, stress, pain, discomfort in their body. And how could that have been connected to some stressful events they've been through, difficult things they're going through in their relationships, worries, and concerns. The last one is the irrelevant type. This one is gonna use all kinds of distractions, go down rabbit holes of conversation in order to avoid talking about feelings, right? So they don't have any really sense of self, other, or context. And sometimes they'll just even you know, use anger or other big emotions to sort of distract from sadness, pain, fear, loneliness. Um, and progress with this group is, is usually a little slower when you've got somebody who really is evasive. So the goal is we want to help them increase their ability to really recognize those thoughts and feelings and acknowledge, you know, what the context needs. And sometimes we just need to lean in um, and be vulnerable and not to worry about, you know, how you're going to look or be perceived by others. And to do that, we have to earn trust. So, you know, people who really struggle with being vulnerable, who throw up a lot of smoke, you know, and distractions, um, being very patient and with your communication, sometimes sitting in silence for a little while um, is a really helpful tool. So, you know, those are just different styles, ways that people kind of gravitate toward communicating. But when we really think about healthy communication, the goal is to have that balanced sense of self and what I need and others and what they may need. Um, and then really reading the context. What is the situation warrant? So I know what I may need, what they may need, but is this the best context for it? or this is a really great context to have a good conversation, but I'm not ready, or the other person doesn't appear to be ready. So having really good communication means that, you know, all of those things really have to be in order for everybody to feel safe and for the best possible outcome to happen. And we wanna work hard to achieve that. So things like what would make this space uh, a safe space for you to feel like you could share with me what's going on, right? I tell the story all the time about how I have, a, you know, kids and I have teenagers now, which I can't believe I have all teenagers, but um, sometimes the more, the way I get the most from them is just by being in the room and quiet. So car rides are famous for that, or sometimes they'll be in their room and I'll just pop in and, and just lay on the bed and just lay there quiet. And all of a sudden they open up because the context has to work for the person to feel safe, to be able to open up. And if healthcare settings are scary places for patients, 
that may be really tough, which is why my chart systems or patient portals have been really great partners for opening up communication, not only with the patient, but the family, because otherwise you wouldn't have access to all this really important information. Words, voice, tone, body movements, facial expressions, all of that can give us a lot of information um, on what the person is intending. Like I said, if somebody's smiling but crying, um, now sometimes people cry when they're happy, but we have to take in all of that so that we can make sure, you know, we're understanding and getting the most from that message that that person's trying to send. Um, it's really hard to use congruent communication though when we're stressed. So I just, you know, really encourage people too that if you're not feeling you're at your best or the other person isn't feeling they're at their best, then maybe agree to talk about it tomorrow. Sometimes we're such creatures of opportunity that we'll say, no, we're going to talk about it now, knowing that your partner just dashed in from work and they had a bad day. And it's probably not a great time to talk about the credit card bill or the fact that you know, something, you know, happened to the car. Um, so we always call that the ambush that happens when people get home from work and then they get ambushed with all of the really stressful stuff. And so maybe as a family, we learn that we need to wait until everybody settles. Some people need to go, if they're introverts, they need to go to a quiet space and sort of reset, and then they can come out and talk. People might be like that at work, and certainly healthcare environments can create a lot of that chaos too, and giving people a chance to decrease their stress before they communicate, like pausing before you go in to see a patient, just taking a breath to kind of clear a little bit of what you may have been carrying from a previous conversation. And then last, healthy communication, lots and lots of I statements. And I statements, we hear that a lot, but that's because it's positioning the frame of reference from you. So it leaves us from feeling like we're blaming other people or other people are blaming us, but they're taking ownership. You're taking ownership over your thoughts and feelings. So I think, I feel, I wonder it just gives the person the opportunity to not feel like they have to immediately defend themselves. When we start with you make me feel, then right away the human brain is about defense and they're not going to be listening to what you're trying to say. A lot of times as a family therapist, that's what I'm doing is I'm slowing down communication so that the listener and the speaker both play that really important role that they need to play in that exchange, right? So what we bring to the conversation truly matters. And as providers, we need to be aware of the personal values that we also bring to the relationship, as well as the patient's culture and how it's affecting their perspectives on their management of their health and their healthcare decision-making. And if we don't pay really careful attention to that, it could really adversely affect health outcomes. We may not get all the information we need for an accurate diagnosis. We may not um, understand why parts of the treatment plan are not being followed through. We may see repeated, in fact, we do through research, see repeated hospital admissions and lower treatment adherence because individuals have not been thoroughly heard or understood. And the decision-making that they're doing is not done necessarily in the exam room, but outside of it. So what we bring to the conversation matters. There's a model for cross-cultural communication that I'm not sure if you learned, no pun intended, but it's called LEARN, that's the acronym. And so it begins with LISTEN. So it's really important when we're interviewing patients that we start off by listening. We assess their understanding of their health condition, what they think is causing it, what potential treatments they may have tried or that they want to try, what their expectations are for the encounter. Um, we want to bring our most curious and humble self to that part of the conversation because the real outcome of that is building trust and joining. 
So listening, and there's been research studies over the years about interrupting and how many seconds into an encounter we tend to interrupt people when they're trying to tell their story. So some of the best providers I've ever seen are those who just wait until the patient breathes and then they pause and then they ask. So listening is a critical part. And if you did that in any of your relationships, I think you would see positive outcomes. Explain. So the E in learn is to explain. It's that where we get a chance to convey perceptions of the health condition. We may have patients with different health literacy levels. And so our ability to explain it may have to be with the assistance of pictures or videos or um, different types of layperson terms so that they can understand best what we're trying to say. Um, we may have to also bring in interpreters because even though they may be fluent in English, when emotions and stress go up, if their dominant language is Spanish or another language, they're going to want to listen and communicate through that. So those are important things. Keep in mind, the A is acknowledge, be respectful when discovering, discussing those differences of views and perspectives. So I always like to point out, here's where we agree. So we both agree that this is an issue. We both agree that this is not where we want to be for your health. And then try to figure out where we can move together, you know, and where these differences that we might be having, whether... I want to try a medication and you want me to try a dietary change. Is there a way that these two different things, we can kind of make them work together so that we can resolve this difference of opinion? But we always want to start off acknowledging where we're lining up first, because that lets the person know you're listening and there are things that you're sharing together and that the differences um, can be resolved if we know we have some commonality. And then recommend, so the L-E-A-R recommend is develop and propose a treatment plan. So you develop and propose a treatment plan and this said to the patient and their family, I would change that to say with. So if we develop with versus two, then the chances of their adherence of that is even greater. There's a whole intervention called motivational interviewing um, and I'm sure many of you've been trained in it, but the whole purpose of that is to align yourself with the person that you're trying to help move through to achieve some sort of change. So we want to propose, we want to recommend, we want to develop with, and then negotiate. Sometimes there is a little bit of negotiation that has to happen, particularly if it's involved with behavioral changes or maybe medications or different types of tests that the patient might be interested in or not interested in. So there may be some negotiation that has to happen and acknowledgement of some culturally, prep, culturally relevant preferences that the patient may also want to be a part of that experience. So there's some case scenarios that I have prepared. So we'll read through them and we'll talk about how to apply LEARN to it. The first one is a pediatrician working in an outpatient clinic in an urban center. Myrna is a 10-year-old Inuit girl from the Northern Inuit community. You're seeing her for symptoms of depression and oppositional behavior. You ask her mother about these behaviors and you find that she's not sharing much information. You ask Myrna how things are going at home. Your question is greeted by silence. Her mother looks away. So some of the points to be aware of, and I purposefully have brought out a cultural group that maybe you haven't or have had some experience with just to show how important it is that we operate from a position of cultural awareness, right? So knowing how to interpret and respond to silence it's a real skill and it really does help you as a provider understand and not misinterpret that silence. So silence can come from discomfort with a question. Silence can mean the person is not wanting to answer the question. Silence can mean cognitive confusion about the question, apprehension about why you might even be asking it. And so 
particularly for Inuit and other cultures, facial expressions may also be used to respond. So they might think they're responding by the facial expression that they're giving. And so we really need to make sure we're understanding those nonverbals as well. It's really important that we don't just jump in to fill that silence as healthcare providers, but really understand it. And that mutual trust can really empower families once we are aware of how they best communicate the use of silence in that. Um, so the other thing that I wanna really think about is applying this learn model is we really wanna assess like what MERN is there and the family's expectation for the visit. Inquiring about the family's background, their concerns, their understanding of the purpose for the visit. So it could be that we have to spend more time on that front end to be able to really figure out how we can come up with a really good treatment plan and any specific questions that they might have before we begin giving our assessment or our diagnosis or delivering the plan. And this approach can really alleviate family stress and concern. So here's another example is you're volunteering with a medical organization overseas. So if this is something that some of you might do and you go over to a country like India and you see a nine month old boy whose name's Ayan who has severe iron deficiency anemia um, and is being breastfed with no solid food intake. You advise his mother on the importance of iron supplements and of transitioning to iron rich solid foods. As you counsel, she lowers her gaze and she shakes her head. You assume that the mother is worried about the side effects of a foreign medication and you begin to reassure her. She responds that she'll try to follow your directions, but still averts her gaze. So some of the points that this case draws out when I think about it is traditionally in Western cultures, we use direct, low context forms of communication and we don't rely heavily on nonverbal cues, whereas in this culture, that was very important. Those nonverbal cues are really important. We also want to be aware, you know, of different types of cultural generalizations as well. So just because somebody might be from a country where you've learned that they don't do certain things when they communicate or they do other things when they communicate, we still want to ask or understand more um, so that we can make sure we're interpreting their signals, their cues, their understanding um, correctly. And so the learn model is you wanna ask the mom, for example, whether she has concerns about anemia or iron supplements. You notice that there was a little head going down thing and you're not quite sure if it was disagreement or maybe she's being, you know, she's confused or she's really hard on herself or that's a respectful, you know, I understand. So you just want to ask if she has any concerns. You also reassure her that it's okay for her to express concern or disagree. A lot of patients don't know they have that privilege. She divulges, divulges about her concerns that lie with the recommendations for solid foods rather than iron supplements because she's worried her son doesn't have any teeth yet and he might choke. And so your reassurance of you know, what and how she can deliver the solid foods and how she can do it safely. And maybe even finding some foods that are more culturally um, relevant to her that she feels like introducing would feel comfortable. So you negotiate that through that learn. Okay, and then the last example is working with interpreters. And I do this a lot and maybe many of you do as well, but you're seeing Wasim, which is a two-year-old boy who's recently arrived as a refugee from Iraq. His parents speak mainly Arabic. His eldest brother, Faris, is a 13-year-old who agrees to translate for you. You use the LEARN model. You start by asking open-ended questions about the family's migration history and their prior and current living conditions. He tells you that most of the story without asking his parents questions. When you ask about challenges with acculturation, Faris replies that the family's doing fine. You later learn that Wasim says only a few words and is not yet walking. You wonder how you might gain a clearer understanding of the issues contributing to Wasim's developmental delay. So some of the learning points is providing care in a language that the family doesn't speak. We know through research is a big risk factor 
for negative effects and health outcomes. So even though one of the family members might speak the same language you do, they may not speak it in a way to communicate health or healthcare needs. So it's always good to find out if there is a preferred language that they would like to have their visit in and if you have the capacity to be able to bring in an online interpreter to help. Um, cultural interpreters are trained to help families navigate medical conversations. So we want to refrain from them just bringing in a friend or a neighbor or using one of the children in the family, but rather bringing in somebody who has that training. I was just talking to a friend of mine who works in a law firm and similar, you know, is that there's a legal language that comes with interpreting. And if you just bring somebody in who speaks the same language as the person, but doesn't know the legal language, it could also be harmful. So we want to make sure these cultural interpreters are trained in healthcare settings, and they can do a very good job to kind of help the family system and you to get on the same page. We want to stay away from things like Google Translate. So I can't tell you how many times I've heard that is way off. Now, if you're trying to find the word that you want to use, like hello or thank you or pain, a uh, one word that you want to try to communicate, that can be good. But to use it for all your documentation or a full conversation, they said it really is not an effective tool. Um, some tips for working with interpreters is definitely familiarize yourself with the services in your area. And if you don't have a service where you can have somebody come into the room with you, then there's some there's different companies out there that you can buy a service through and either through an iPad, sometimes through just the phone, they can provide that service. Um, you want to make sure you can arrange the next appointment so that the person knows there's going to be the interpreter there and make sure transportation arrangements are con confirmed because you would hate to get everything together and then it doesn't it falls apart um, make sure you introduce everybody who's present that's really important as well so that we know who's in the room and who's hearing things who's hearing their information and then sometimes it's helpful to debrief with the interpreter afterwards and I can tell you just doing mental health that sometimes some of the content can be pretty challenging and pretty difficult. And having time to debrief with the interpreter is really helpful. The other thing I walk with um, my healthcare providers around is their cultural humility. So part of what it is to be an effective provider is to be aware of our own biological, psychological, social, and spiritual triggers. So what are the areas that we're most sensitive to or aware of so that if we encounter them in interaction, interaction with somebody, we know that's, that's a part of our stuff. Um, everything from you know, somebody who doesn't want to have a living will, somebody who doesn't uh, want to address another family member's depression, says they'll just get over it. You know, somebody who um, doesn't call and cancel appointments, you know, they just no show. And so some of these things are really hot button trigger issues for us. And knowing those things are important because in certain environments, they may not translate into what you think it does. I know when I first um, moved here, our clinics were working really hard on the no-show rates. And they were spending lots and lots and lots of time coming up with policies to sort of penalize patients who were not canceling. And somebody said, you know, did you ever think that potentially they just don't think that their time is valuable to you? So they're doesn't, they don't think to cancel, not because they're being disrespectful, but because they don't think it's going to make a difference in your day. And it was like this light bulb went off for people and they realized they were spending all this time focusing on these policies that were from their bias that people didn't respect their time, but they weren't even thinking that the bias may have been people didn't feel disrespect, that, that the people didn't feel respected to begin with. So Observing culture of humility is really important. Being able to create space for that when we're creating policies and procedures can help us to really connect better with our communities. 
So things like cultural competence, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, cultural humility, you may hear these words, but they are really important things to be in the fabric of the work that we do. Competence just makes us want to learn more about the people that we serve. It's a lifelong journey. Awareness is the cognitive awareness of what um, customs, cultures are around us and holiday celebrations, rituals, ways of managing health. Sensitivity is more the emotional delicacy of it, the nonverbal reads. All of those things are really important in combination with our own cultural humility to be able to provide really good, effective communication. Taking into account social locations, which is also important to communication, our gender, race, social class, age, um, educational backgrounds, where we're from geographically, all of those things intersect and come together and can affect communication. So it's really important that we're also attending to those things as well. And then where all of my identities come together and where that meets all of your identities can be where there's a challenge. So just owning that and understanding that. Um, Galanti devised what's called the four C's of culture. There's call, cause, cope, and concern. And what Galanti said is when we go into an encounter with somebody to really help with promoting effective communication, if we can operate from these four areas, we'll be more likely to be able to have a really effective exchange. So the first one that Galanti says is we wanna ask our patients, what do you call the problem? What do you, what are you naming the issue? Um, what do you think is wrong? because it allows us to then use their language and their phrasing, which will help promote connection, um, which will help us to be able to come up with an even better treatment plan for the patient because they, they can see and hear that we understand. So maybe I call it depression, but you call it sadness. Or maybe um, he calls it diabetes and she calls it sugar. Or they call it anxiety and the doctor calls it um, nerves. So whatever the languages are that people use, that's what we need to be bringing into the room. Um, even though we might, according to the DSM or the ICD, be labeling it something different. I had one client once that um, didn't like the word bulimia nervosa. So instead of that, she asked that we call it issues. And then she had also had some pretty significant trauma and she didn't want to talk about the exact type of trauma by name. So we called it it. So for the course of treatment, it was issues and it, and that opened up tremendous um, space for her to begin working on those concerns. The second is cause. What do you think caused your problems? That gets at the belief systems that patients may have. Some of our patients believe it's because they didn't do something right, um, that they deserve it, that they didn't follow recommendations. But we wanna understand, we wanna understand all the things they've tried and maybe some of the unfair pressure that they put on themselves thinking that you know, they caused it because they didn't rest enough when they were pregnant or they didn't take enough vitamins um, when they were younger or, and we can use science and we can use our knowledge to be able to alleviate some of the guilt and blame that we talked about earlier that people might be putting on themselves, but we won't know that unless we ask them, what do they think caused it? Another way to get at a person's perspective and understand their communication is a cope. So how do they cope? What are the things that they're doing to try to make it better? Um, what else have they tried? How does it affect their daily routines? Um, coping is a really big one because it allows us to lean on strengths. And so when we're trying to have effective communication, if we ask how they're coping, we can then amplify those strengths and that can also help us build connection. Hopefully the coping is a healthy coping and if not, it allows us to do some education there. 
And then the last one is concern. What concerns do you have regarding your condition? How serious do you think it is? What complications do you fear? How does it interfere with your life or your ability to function? So this is really important because a lot of our patients will come to us with really significant theories and worries. And that's important that we know so that we can allay any of that if at all possible. So to close, I ask people to remember that just because you share some part of an identity with another person, it doesn't mean that our experiences are all the same. And that comes with communication and that comes with reaching you know, some sort of understanding and agreement with the people that we're trying to take care of. That sometimes healthy communication is just about slowing down and listening a little bit more so that we can provide the very best care, which is always our intentions. So that's the end of the slides that I have for you today. And I just wanna open it up to any conversation or chat that questions that you may have posed while I was presenting. Well, and I certainly understand communication is one of those things that it's a really important tool but if you think about even scenarios that you may have had and things that were difficult and challenging, we can certainly use those as opportunities to, to de-identify, but talk about it. So sometimes I'll hear providers too talk about how tough it is um, when they have more than one person in the room and the conflict and how to deal with conflict in an exam room. You know, and that can be really tricky because you're trying to manage the patient's needs and then you're watching all of these communication dynamics fly across the room. So there's a technique that I like to teach my families and I don't know if this could help you just to slow it down, but I'll oftentimes like take a pen and I'll talk about, you know, how we're gonna to try to slow things down a little bit so that we can understand. Maybe it's a tongue depressor, maybe it's a piece of paper, whatever you have available. And just whoever has the pen is the speaker. So we get the chance to really hear what that one person really wants to say, and then they can pass that on to somebody else to be able to speak. So it slows down the communication a little bit and the rest of the people's job in the room is just to repeat back what they're hearing. So whether it's me as the provider repeating back what the person's saying, or you're trying to get family members to repeat that back to each other, you're just getting everybody to slow down and you're de-escalating. So Jennifer, we do have a question from yeah. Kathleen. Are there any studies that show what are the biggest communication errors that healthcare providers are guilty of? Well, I said one earlier, which is interrupting. So I think we tend, like I think one study had like 18 seconds in, it's an incredibly fast amount of time where we interrupt, we don't give people a chance to finish their thoughts. So that is particularly one. And then, the other is just sort of, when I hear a lot of people say, you just don't feel listened to. So I guess not taking a lot of time as providers to reflect back what they're hearing. So what I hear you saying is just making sure, did I understand, did I get that? Um, because a lot of times when we see litigation happen in healthcare systems, they're, they go back to say they didn't feel listened to, they didn't feel heard. So if healthcare, big mistake that a lot of times we make is we just don't validate and reflect back what we're hearing. It doesn't mean you have to agree, but reflecting back. Those are really important things. So not interrupting and reflecting back. Thank you, Jennifer. Absolutely. Uh, we did have a comment that Folks really like what you said about waiting for the other person to breathe before starting to talk. Uh, so that was well received for sure. Yeah, that's really, and I have a, sometimes as a parent and as a therapist and as a teacher, you know, I struggle because um, my thoughts are moving so quick. And so like you're trying to get to the next patient and you've spent probably a lot of time looking at the chart. So you already know what you wanna talk about. Um, maybe you wanna go in and celebrate 
that their A1C is going in the right direction or that their blood pressure is lower than it was the last time or um, that they're doing such a great job um, following up on their appointments. And you're preparing in your mind this encounter, but then you go in and maybe they have a different agenda. And so incompatible agendas can be another big issue. So if we go in and just, you know, ask an open-ended question and then pause and then see what they come forward with and then pause and then say, is that everything, you know, we're going to have a much more successful visit. I think somehow we were trained to think that if we don't interrupt them, they're going to go on forever. But I will tell you the best healthcare provider my children ever had, ever had, was one where I, he was just one, the only provider in this practice. And he had sick kids all over this practice. I mean, it was a very, very busy building. And I, my child, I think at the time was a toddler and had an ear infection. So of course I was worried about my child, but I knew he had other really much sicker kids out there. And when he came in the room, he sat down, he took off his stethoscope. He looked at my child. He looked at me. He listened. You couldn't have guessed that he had all of these other things he was worried about. He was focused and he was present and he was still. And we probably got out of that visit in less time than if he would have been kind of all over the place and in and out. And, and so he just had this amazing way of doing that and always got out of work on time, retained his staff. It was just a really impressive practice. So I, and that was from a perspective of a parent. So I've tried to take that with me as I've gone and I've trained people over time is sometimes moving faster doesn't necessarily get us there faster. Sometimes slowing down and taking a breath and listening a little bit more can get us there quicker. Thank you, Jennifer. People do really like that idea, especially with students to yeah. just be present and quiet and allowing someone to open up. And that can really work with students as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you, everybody.